I, I lost my voice a few days ago and I'm slowly recovering. Okay, so let me just share the screen with you. Okay, so, so sisters, uh, last week we looked at the very first verse of Surah Al-Fatiha. Um, so today, what we're going to do is that we'll be looking at the second one. And you're going to be thinking, oh my God, how is it that we are on the third lesson and we only reached the second verse? Don't worry, inshallah. Uh, by today's lesson, we would have finished around two or three verses and then next week we'll cover we'll finish the rest bi'idhnillah okay so uh so okay so the verse that we've reached sisters uh so we've now covered alhamdulillah rabbil alameen and if you remember I say, I said that you need to remember what Hamd means. Very important. Hamd. From uh, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. And uh, that means um, uh, thanks and praise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala out of love. Okay. So this is what it means out of love so just remember this because we're going to explore this concept a bit more later inshallah now regarding the second verse okay um it's ar-rahman ar-rahim ar-rahman ar-rahim sometimes it's translated as um uh, as you can see from the, your from the screen, is sometimes translated as um, the most compassionate, the most merciful, the all merciful, the bestower of mercy, the Lord of mercy, the giver of mercy, the beneficent, the merciful, most gracious, most merciful, uh, entirely merciful, the especially merciful. Okay, so there are differences of opinions regarding what is the meaning of Ar Rahman Ar Rahim. What is the difference between Ar Rahman Ar Rahim? <coughs> Some scholars say these two meanings, these two uh, things, Ar Rahman Ar Rahim, mean the same thing. So if they both mean the same thing, why have they been used? They are used in order to um, emphasize, right? But this opinion that Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim means the same thing is very weak because many scholars say there is no such thing as two words in the Arabic language, which have the same meaning. Another meaning, the second meaning, is the word Ar-Rahman <coughs> means to be completely filled with mercy. He is full of mercy. And the name Ar-Rahim means to be consistently and frequently giving mercy right this is the reason why some of the translators have translated it as um, the all merciful and the bestower of mercy the one who has all mercy and he gives mercy <coughs> <coughs> The third meaning is Ar-Rahman refers to the vastness of Allah's mercy. And Ar-Rahim means it refers to the effects 
on his creation. Others have actually said that Ar-Rahman is to do with the essence of Allah, the that of Allah. And Ar-Rahim is related to his actions. Right. So, <coughs> excuse me. So the opinion that I follow is based on something uh, relating to the language, okay? Okay, so I need you to bear with me and I want your participation, okay? So I'm going to ask a question in about a couple of minutes, in, in very shortly. And I want your, I want your, your participation. When we look at these two words, Ar-Rahman and Ar-Rahim, you notice the red part, the ra ha nun ra ha and mean oh, there's actually a mistake there. Yeah, there's a mistake there. Uh, the red part should be on Ar-Rahman. The red part should not be on the Noon. It should be on the Meme. So there's a mistake there. What they do is that they have a, uh, Arabic is very mathematical. It uses formulas. So you, you know, like in maths, they have X and Y, right? For simultaneous equations, for different things. In the same way, <coughs> you have something similar uh, in the Arabic language. Every single word, it has the root word or the root letters. For example, the word kitab, even though it's kaf, ta, alif, ba, there's four letters, the alif is additional. The actual essence or the main, the word, it comes from the word kataba. Um, same thing with Ar-Rahman and Ar-Rahim. It comes from the word Rahama or Rahima. And um, the, the, the letters that the Arabs use as the formula is the word fa'ala. So for the word rahama, although this is actually incorrect, it should be fa'lan, the lamb should be the red. Um, yeah, the lamb should be red. Actually, let me just quickly change this because I don't want this to be confusing. Uh, let me unshare. And let me just make that quick change. I don't want anyone to get confused. Just bear with me, sisters. Allah Mustafa, okay. There's... Uh, don't know why it's coming up like this. Okay, so you have to. Uh, 
Ah. Okay, I'll just have to do it like that. Ah, okay, it's not much I can do. Right, apologies for that, sisters. Uh, okay, so let me just share my screen now. Okay. Right. Um, okay. Yeah, Zakala Khair for the advice regarding the ginger tea and whatnot. I can't have anything because uh, I, I'm fasting at the moment. Um, uh, but also, um, this is a chronic. This is not something ginger tea will help. It, it will help a little bit, but it's something that happens to me quite a lot. So if, I, I cough quite a lot. And then this has an effect. Anyway, let's focus on this, inshallah. So like I said, there's difference of opinion regarding a Rahman and Rahim. So many difference of opinion. Some scholars say a Rahman and a Rahim is the same. Weak opinion, very weak opinion. Some scholars say a Rahman means full of mercy. Rahim means the one who gives mercy. Some scholars say that a Rahman means the essence of Allah, like Allah's being. And a Rahim is the actions of Allah. Okay, so I've actually followed a different opinion based on uh, the language perspective and is a very beautiful understanding of this as well. Okay, and this is <coughs> Ar-Rahman and Ar-Rahim. They both come from three letters, Ra, Ha, and Meen. Okay, these three letters. Now, in the Arabic language, you have something which is, uh, which is based on Ozan or, or formulas so the formula for ar for Rahman, okay, will be fa'lan, okay, be fa'lan. There should be an alif straight on top of the lam, but whenever I do that, it doesn't actually have the it, it doesn't differentiate between the black and the the the, the red and the black. It just comes up as one, unfortunately. I don't know why. And the the example of Rahim, uh, it would be fa'il, okay. Um, so th those of you who know Arabic, I want you to think of words which are on which sound like fa'lan. Okay, so this is a, me asking you a question. So please uh, participate. Um, what the uh, what does the word fa'lan or Rahman in the Arabic language? What does it, uh, what is the, um, the uh, what would fall under that pattern? What does it sound like? Okay, good. I'm getting some good participation. So some sisters are saying, Kaslan. Okay, so try to give the translation as well. So uh, Kaslan, the translation is lazy. Aqilan is not really because you're adding an alif here. Hamdan. Ghafilan. Again, you're adding an alif. It will be ghaflan. Fawzan. Ghadban. Ghadban means to be angry. Jo'an. Very good, sister. So Jo'an means uh, hungry. Uh, Alim, no, no, Alim. Zojan, okay. Ghadban's already been said. Ghasban, okay. Jahilan, no, but you're still adding Alif, sister. Miskan, what does Miskan mean, though? Um, Ghadban, angry. A lot of angry. Sisters here, mashallah. <laughs> Love examples of anger here. Um, yes, rhyming words, rhyming words. Uh, Nisan. Okay, Ramadan. No, Achan. Achan is uh, means thirsty. Good. Uh, Nasran, it means two, it means to be helped twice, so it's not really a proper word. <coughs> uh, 
Okay, so there's quite a few examples. Okay, so I'm going to stop there, sisters. Okay, so let's stop there. Uh, right. So what are the examples? There is lazy, which is kaslan. There is example of thirsty, which is atshan. You have the example of hungry, which is joan. You have the example of angry, which is uh, ghadban. Good. Now, I want you to do the same thing for fa'il or rahim. Come up with words in the Arabic language which sound similar or rhyme with fa'il. Alim, very good. Try to give the translation as well. Alim, someone who has a lot of uh, a lot of knowledge. Karim is someone who's generous or noble. Jamil, someone who's beautiful. Qadir, someone who has a lot of ability. Hakim, someone who's wise. Halim, uh, someone who's forbearing. Tawil, someone who is uh, tall. Very good. Sagir, someone who is small. Good. Okay, let's stop there. Okay, let's stop there, please. Okay. So let's go over some more examples. Sorry, tired is ta'ban, which I forgot to mention. Okay, so fa'il, short. The example is qasir, tall, ta'wil, thin. Who is someone who's thin? Nahif, fat, someone who is samin. Okay, oh God, I hope you didn't see that. Okay, now sisters, if you look at these words, <coughs> angry, lazy, thirsty, hungry, tired, and then you look at the other words, short, thin, fat, tall, what is the difference between these two types of words? What is the difference between these two types of groups of words? So one sister said adjective. Okay. If one is the adjective, what is the other one then? Yeah, they're opposite in what sense? Okay. One sister said verbs and the other one said adjectives. Okay, and give me a bit more in terms of what is a consequence of it being an adjective and it being a verb as an example. Physical attributes and feelings, very nice. Anything else? What do you mean, uh, sister, when you say they can be changes from present to past? One is a description while one is a quality. Okay. Okay, so let's stop there, inshallah. Okay. I'm not going to read any more now. Stop there, please, sisters. <coughs> <clears throat> what is the difference? The ones which are on the right hand of your screen, which is on the wazan, on the rhyme, rhyming of Rahman or Falan is angry, lazy, thirsty, tired, hungry. What brings or gives a meaning to all of these is that they act like verbs. And what are verbs? They are things which are temporary. Right? So when someone's tired, they're not always tired. When someone's lazy, they're not always lazy. When someone's thirsty, they're not always thirsty. These are temporary attributes or temporary verbs. They act like verbs. Okay? Now, if you look at those words which are on the wazan of fa'il, they act like nouns. And nouns, generally speaking, are permanent. When someone's tall, they're tall. That's it. Halas. 
we're, we're talking about adults here. Generally speaking, when someone's thin, someone's fat, they're like that for a very long time. Unless they do something drastic. Right, so what has this all got to do with Ar-Rahman and Ar-Rahim? You may say to me, Zakallah Khair, Sheikh Asif, you've given us a nice Arabic lesson. But what has this all got to do with the Rahman and Rahim? So, based on the linguistic understanding of Ar Rahman and Rahim, some scholars they say, and this is a very strong opinion, pay attention to the sisters. The Ar Rahman is the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which is for the believers and the disbelievers in the dunya. Whilst the mercy of Allah, of Ar-Rahim, is the mercy of Allah for the believers in the hereafter, which is permanent. Does that make sense? So based on this linguistic understanding, the meaning of Ar-Rahman is the temporary mercy of Allah for the believers and the disbelievers in this dunya. Whilst the meaning of Ar-Rahim is the mercy of Allah for the believers only in the hereafter. So this is a very strong opinion and it's something which I favor. So for instance, as an example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he, when he's describing his mercy towards the believers, what word would he, what name would he use? Would he use Rahman? Would he use Rahim? He would use Rahim. Allah says in the Quran, وَكَانَ بِالْمُؤْمِنِينَ رَحِيمًا And with the believers, he was Rahim. Okay? So this is something which is really amazing. Um, now, let's open the, the discussion or the verse, these two were these two names in light of the verse that came before it and the verse that came after it. Okay, this is incredible, sisters. So pay attention. If you're not concentrating, you won't get these, you won't understand these things. Okay, so please concentrate. Now, here's a question for you What is the relationship between Ar Rahman and the verse that came before it? And what is the relationship between Ar Rahim and the verse that comes after it? Okay, so Um Zaid said, Allah is merciful to, the, to all the creation he created. Okay, but what, how is that connected to the previous verse? Someone said, Alameen. So, F. Habib Muhammad, you have to explain what that, what does that mean? Don't give me one uh, word answers. You have to explain. Attributes of Allah. Very good. One of the sisters has got it for one of the verses, which is Ar Rahman. What about Ar Rahim? Very good. Okay, so Sister Aisha Munir, she got the whole, uh, she got the she got the answer. Okay, so everyone say Mashallah, Mashallah, Sister Aisha. Okay, so I'm not going to read any more now. So if you look at Ar Rahman, um, I said that Ar Rahman means the mercy of Allah, the temporary mercy of Allah for the believers and the disbelievers. This is connected to the word Alamin. Because the Alameen means the world, it means the humankind and the jinn, 
the accountable human and jinn, okay, which is related to the dunya. So the word Ar Rahman is connected to that. But the word Ar Rahim is connected to the next verse, which is Maliki Omidin, which talks about the day of judgment, the owner of the day of judgment, where the believers will get the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, so very good. Now, there is actually one thing that I wanted to mention. So there's no confusion. I don't want to cause any confusion. Does this mean when we use the word Ar-Rahman uh, that it means that Allah's uh, attributes are temporary? Of course not. It doesn't mean that Allah's attribute is temporary. It means that the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses it is for that particular period of time. So, for instance, when a human being can be doing many, has many roles, it doesn't mean that they're doing all of those roles at the same time. So, for instance, a person, like example, pretend that I'm a cook. I'm not a cook. I'm not very good at cooking, unfortunately. Okay. But let's just say that I'm, I, I can cook. I can drive. I can uh, write, do things on my laptop, right? Because I've got these attributes, these qualities, it doesn't mean that I'm doing them all of the time at the same time, okay? And even Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he, talk, he talks about Rahman in the context of the Akhirah, he says as an example, Ar-Rahmanu ala al istawa that Ar-Rahman, he is rising above the throne. But that's, in the, uh, that's actually something that is happening, not necessarily relating to the dunya. Because what it does is that it relates to the whole of creation. And this is the point about Rahman, the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is for the whole of creation. Okay? So don't get confused. I don't mean that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's attribute of mercy is temporary. I'm not saying this. I'm just saying that this mercy that he is using on Rahman is for generally a specific period and that is for the believers and the disbelievers for the <coughs> excuse me in the dunya okay so the word noun um, is something which is a naming thing. So anything, a phone, a laptop, anything that you can see, generally speaking, is a noun. And a noun generally tends to be something which is a permanent thing. The word verb is an action. Sleeping, drinking, talking, thinking, these are actions. Actions are usually temporary because they have three tenses, the past, the present, and also the future. Okay. Uh, so we'll stop there, inshallah. And let's go into the next verse. So after this, uh, inshallah ta'ala, I hope you sisters can appreciate, you know, the beauty of the Quran, the beauty of you know, if you look into the Quran in a deeper way, it really expands your mind. And for me, when I read this discussion from the scholars, it blew my mind. All right. Okay. Okay. So we come to Maliki Yom ad -Din. Okay. Maliki Yom ad -Din. Now, when it comes to Maliki Yom ad -Din, there's many... Um, a number of meanings. A number of meanings of Maliki Omidin. And there's two ways of reciting Maliki Omidin. There's Maliki Omidin with an alif or the mud, and Maliki Omidin without the mud will be, it will have a different meaning. So Malik would mean owner. And Malik means king. So what this, the meaning of this verse is that he is Malik of the day of resurrection. So he will resurrect 
and he will compensate. He will reward and he'll punish. Um, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, um, sorry, some of the Mufassirin, they say, what is the difference between Malik and Malik? And some of them say that it's similar to one of the opinions of Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. Ar-Rahman means the that of Allah. Ar-Rahim means the action of Allah. The essence or the being of Allah and the action. So they say the same thing regarding uh, Malik and Malik. That one of them means the essence. The other one means the, um, the action. Now, Al-Malik and Malik are names of Allah. And it is important to note that it is not, it is unlawful to call anyone by the name of Al-Malik and Al-Malik. So with the Alif and Lam or the Al before it. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, on the day of resurrection, Allah will hold the earth and fold the heavens with his right hand. Then he will say, I am the king. Where are the kings on earth? Um, also, the Prophet ﷺ said, Indeed, the most disloyal and treacherous name in the sight of Allah is that of a person named the king of kings malikul amlak so this is something which is not allowed this is a hadith in bukhari but in muslim he adds for there is no malik except allah the mighty and the magnificent now what is the difference between malik and malik the word malik which means owner means to own something to the extent that you can dispose of it. But when we own something, <coughs> excuse me, in the dunya, we have ownership with restriction. So for instance, if we own a house, we can't do anything we want to that house. We have to go to the council, we have to go to the government, and we have to say to them, that, can I please make my house bigger? Can I do this to my house? Can I do that to my house? So whenever we have ownership in this world, it tends to be with restriction. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has complete ownership and full ownership. Now the word Malik, which means king, the meaning of this is a king that is obeyed or someone who has authority. But the authority of the kings in this world is very different to the kingship of Allah, of course. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the absolute king. He sets the rules and even the laws of nature. So even if someone disobeys Allah's authority, he knows about it. And that person will face the consequences. The kings of our times, they don't know. They don't know what people are saying about them behind their back. But if we were to look at these two names together, Malik and Malik, there's a number of things that we can combine. 
the Malik, the king, is responsible for those who are under his authority. The Malik, the owner, the king is, has a responsi responsibility upon his subjects, whilst uh, the owner only has responsibility upon the thing that he owns. Some of the scholars, they say that Malik is better than Mal Malik because the meaning of the owner is more than the king by nature. Some of the scholars, they, they, they say the opposite, that king is more comprehensive, it, it, it gives a, a stronger feeling. And in actual fact, this is less than an owner because there are many owners in a country, as an example, where there's only one king. But the point is the qualities of the owner and the qualities of king combined without restrictions should really make us understand the amazing nature of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his, his greatness and his uh, magnificence. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then says, Yawm al-Din, which is very strange. Why is it strange? The reason why this is strange is because um, the most common name for the Day of Judgment is Yawm al Qiyamah. If I were to ask you, sisters, if I say Day of Judgment, <coughs> what is the word that comes to your mind in Arabic? You say Yawm al Qiyamah or Yawm al Hisab. No one will say Yawm al Deen. It's a very uncommon word for the day of judgment. So a question for you sisters. Why does Allah use Yawm al -Din? What does Yawm al -Din even mean? What's the difference between Yawm al -Din and Yawm al -Qiyama? So those of you who know the answers, just answer, uh, ask it very, uh, answer very quickly, please. Someone said unique. Believers, the final day determined. It is the day, the religion. <laughs> Deen is religion. Deen can be translated as religion or creed. The day of payment of debts, judgment, day of resurrection. Okay, we'll stop there, inshallah, sisters. So if you can just stop there. Yawm al qiyama which means the day of standing, is only one part of the day of judgment. It is one part of the day of judgment. Yawm al hisab which means a day of accounting, is only one part of the day of judgment. The Yawm al -Din is one of the most comprehensive names for the Day of Judgment. Because it means every single stage of the Day of Judgment. Also, The, it is more appropriate to use the word Yom Adin here. As we'll find out in next week's lesson, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about three di different types of people. Those who have been favored, which are the believers. Those who have earned anger, which are like the Bani Israel. And number three, those who have been misguided. 
And the Prophet Sallallahu said that these, this is like someone who is like the Christian. So knowing that the end of the surah talks about the different religions, it's more appropriate to use the word Yom ad -Din. And there's other reasons as well. Um, the word deen it me has many meanings so it doesn't just mean the stages the meaning means judgment reckoning obedience so that's another meaning another reason or wisdom why yom deen is mentioned Okay, so I have another question for you before we go on to the next verse, sisters. And that is, I want you to summarize each of the verses that we've covered in one word or one emotion. So when you read Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, what one word describes that verse? So you just write one word. The second verse, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim. What one word, how does that one word make you feel? Describe that verse in one emotional, one feeling. When you read this one verse, Malik Yom Adin, how does this make you feel in one word? So I want you to write three words, each of them describing the three verses. Wow, there's a lot of, Answers, subhanAllah. Try to uh, write it in one message. When you say praise, okay, mercy, uh, no, I want it in one message. So, for instance, one sister has already done this. Let me see if I can find it and scroll down. So, Um Zaid, okay, wrote, oh, there's a direct message. She wrote number one, praise, number two, mercy, number three, fear. Okay, so I want you to do it like this. Don't write, you know, just one message and that's it. I want you to write three words in that one message. Someone else said beginning, mercy, fear. Praise, mercy, fear. Praise, mercy, king. Praise, mercy, justice. Okay, so one sister's got the right answer. Okay, I'm not going to mention the answer. Gratitude, mercy, ownership. Uh, praise, mercy. Oh my God, there's so many answers. Allahu Akbar. Okay, Zakallah khair for Zakallah khair sisters for your participation. Right, so we're going to stop there. So no need to write any more now. Okay. So when you read Ar Rahman Ar Rahim, what this does for you. Knowing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most merciful. That he gives us so many things without us asking for it. He gave us eyes and ears and hearing and seeing. and He gave us life. He gave us our heartbeats. Knowing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is this merciful what this brings about in us is hope. When you go to the next verse, Malik Yom Deen, you know that Allah is a king and the owner of the day of judgment. When you read this verse, what this does is that it, it puts in us fear. What about the first verse? Because the first verse, the second verse, and the second, third, third verse, very easy, very clear. Ar Rahman, Ar Rahim, hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Malik Yawmuddin, Allah is the owner of the day of judgment. Okay, I fear him. What about the first verse? And this is the reason why I've been saying this quite a lot, sisters. You need to remember the definition of what is Hamd. Hamd 
And I've said this so, so many times. I even remember, reminded you today as well, even though I said it last week. Hamd means the to thank and to praise Allah out of love. So what a person should walk away with when they read the first verse, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, is love. Okay? So you have love, hope, and fear. Love, hope, and fear. Okay? So you don't have to write any more. Don't write any more things in the chat box. The answer, I've given you the answer, sisters. There's no, no, nothing to add. Right. Now look at the beauty of the Quran. Allah in these first three verses <coughs> has introduced himself. He has introduced himself as Allah, as Rabb, as Ar Rahman, Ar Rahim, Malik. And all of these things that be mentioned, they will be mentioned in the third person, which means that Allah is telling us about himself. What, are the th uh, what is the third person? First person is when I say something, I am speaking about myself, that's first person. Second person is when I'm speaking to you. Third person is when I'm speaking about someone else. You know, sister Khadija, she's a very good sister. She has very good qualities. I'm speaking about her. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about, when he's mentioning these three things, these three verses, they're in the third person. And these three verses, the first verse talks about love, the second thing, verse talks about hope, and the third verse talks about fear. Now, this is the beauty of the Quran systems. If you go on to the next verse, it is, إِيَّاكَ نَعْبُدُ وَإِيَّاكَ نَسْتَعِينَ Absolutely amazing. You alone we worship and you alone we ask for help. <coughs> we have now been introduced to Allah. We know who Allah is. Now we know who Allah is. We can speak to him directly. And we're speaking to him in the second person. We are addressing Allah. But not only this, we are so amazed by who Allah is. It leads us, the more we learn about Allah, the more we want to worship him. How do we worship Allah? We worship Allah through the three verses. The scholars, they say that the pillars of worship, the arkanul ibadah, the pillars of worship are three. Love hope and fear. You see the beauty of the Quran sisters. It's amazing. Some of the scholars, they say that worship is like a bird. The body is love. One wing is hope. The other wing is fear. And this is what worship is. And when we look at how do we understand love, hope, and fear? How do we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through these three things? The scholars, they say that the minimum or the most important element from these three things is love. Because a person, if they have hope and they ha or they have fear, they won't be alive. Because if you look at the analogy of the bird, love is the body. 
This is what gives us life, love. So you may, if you only live with love, you may be disabled that you have no wings. You may not be able to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala properly or fully, should I say, but you're alive. A person who lives with hope and only with fear, you don't have a bird. Some of the scholars, they say something very nice. When you do things out of love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you should always do things out of love. But when you do things out of fear and hope, does that mean they should be equal? Some people say that our love, our fear and our hope should be equal. Not necessarily. Some of the scholars, such as Abdullah ibn Mubarak and others, and Ibn Qayyim, they say that you should, when you are healthy, you should live with more fear than hope. Because when you live with more fear than hope, then you would be uh, more conscious of Allah's borders. You know, I don't know. Uh, I know we all live from live in different countries, right? But in London, when you're driving on a road, you'll have speed cameras. When you have these speed cameras, they're yellow. And they are trying to tell you, you need to slow down. So generally speaking, we live with fear, right? The laws, a lot of the laws that we have, if you go against the law, then you'll be punished. But we don't have any laws that if you follow the laws, then you will be um, you'll be rewarded. You don't have this in any country, generally speaking. So the human psych psyche is one in which human beings, they do things and they stay within the boundaries out of fear. So the scholars, they say, when you are healthy then and you're in a good situation, generally speaking, you should live with more fear than hope. But if you are sick and if you are on your deathbed, then you should hope more than you should fear. This is what some of the scholars have actually mentioned. I'm really sorry, sisters, I'm not really allowing you to ask questions. It's just there's so much to get through. Surah Al-Fatiha is a, is a surah that requires not four weeks or four hours. It requires a really long time. Okay. I'm trying to go through some of the verses. But inshallah ta'ala, I promise uh, in next week's lesson, I will allow you to ask questions right towards the end. Inshallah. There's a few thing, more things I wanted to mention. Some of the scholars, they say this is the most important verse in the Quran. Because it summarizes our life, why we were created. This, this verse in actual fact summarizes the whole of the Quran. That you alone we worship. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you alone we worship. Meaning we do not worship anyone other than Allah. And then you alone we seek help. The thing is, is that this, this, this part of the verse may be a little bit confusing. Because people may say, well, hang on, but I ask help from other people. I ask help from other people. Does that mean that I, this is wrong? No, you can ask help from other people. The things they are unable to give you, you only ask help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay. Um, okay. So inshallah, sisters, we're gonna um, we're gonna stop here. Inshallah, we come to the end of the lesson, um, and I hope inshallah you benefited from today's lesson. Next week's lesson will be the last lesson, and I'll cover 
uh, the, uh, the next few verses, verses five, six, and seven. And inshallah, I'm going to try to link this, li this verse with the verse that comes after it, inshallah. And we didn't really talk too much about uh, this, um, uh, this, uh, this, this, this image. We'll talk about this in a bit more detail next week, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, sisters, make the, uh, take advantage as much as you can in the last 10 days, okay? Um, your Laylatul Qadr is, is coming up. This is the opinion of the many other scholars. So try to take advantage. Even those sisters who are, no, who are not allowed to fast and pray because they're on the menses, try to do extra actions. Uh, try to stay up the night, a little part of the night. Uh, try to uh, make as much adhkar as possible. Uh, those sisters who are in the situation, you are not allowed to touch the mushaf, but you can use gloves. Some scholars say that you can use gloves. You can use your phone, your Quran on your phone, okay? Try to avoid touching the Arabic letters. Or you can use a laptop. So there's so many different ways of getting around this, okay? But anyway, irrespective, sisters, please take advantage of these 10 days. This is a day which Allah subhan this night this is a night that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes is khayrun min alf shahr it is better than a thousand months a thousand months is about 83 years and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't say it is equal to a thousand months he said it's better so minimum of a lifetime so this night is a minimum of a lifetime so take advantage of the sisters and uh, make dua uh, the, the, the way that you should make du'a is like this. Do it like a circle. Make du'a for yourself. Make du'a for the people around you. The people around you are your family. Okay, mention them by name. Then mention your friends after this. The circle becomes bigger. Then make du'a for uh, people that you don't know, which will be the ummah, right? Make du'a for me, your teachers. Make du'a for the whole of the ummah. Make du'a for what's happening in Palestine, subhanAllah, the situation... It's so heartbreaking. But the point is, make dua for anyone who's being oppressed around the world. Make dua for people who are suffering. Okay. So, this is a really opportune time to make dua. The Prophet, Aisha, and she asked the Prophet, Ya Rasul, what shall I say if, 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 uh, if I meet Layla to Qadr? She, he said that you should say, Allahumma inna ka. Oh Allah, you, lo you love to forgive, so forgive me. Okay, so try to take advantage of these 10 day sisters. Uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you, and may, uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the tawfiq to be able to make this the best Ramadan that we can be in the highest level of Iman and action. Uh, when we are, um, uh, when it, when we if we were to meet you, uh, the, the Laylatul Qadr, and I'll see you sisters next week, inshallah. Zakumullah khair. Subhanakallah wa bihamdik. Shumullah ilayla and astaghfirullah wa tuwilek. Salamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.